Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and this is the MCrit Podcast. This episode was recorded at Smack Gold. This is my surgical airway talk. Now, even I am sick of talking about surgical airway on the podcast. We've done a lot on it, but uh, this lecture incorporates a ton of stuff that had changed since those previous podcasts. They have to be at least a year and a half ago where I discuss my approach to surgical airway. Um, many things have shifted since then. Crycon has changed. My approach to the actual procedure has changed. Ah, so I think you're going to get something out of this. And if you have never done a cricothyrotomy, I think you'll get a ton out of this. Or at least I hope you will. And if you don't, let me know in the comments because I want to hear about it. And I have a bunch of additional references in the show notes, mcrit.org 131. So go on over and check it out. And I hope you enjoy it. Bye-bye. All right. I'm glad to be back in front of you folks again. So could I have my slides, please, my friends? All right. So this is a topic I've been wanting to talk about at SMAC for a long time now, and I finally get to do it. We're going to talk about the crash surgical airway. Now, when it comes down to a procedure like this, a procedure that's life-saving, a procedure that is, to many of us, unfamiliar, experience plays a large role. When you look at the dogfighters, the pilots involved in aerial combat, it's said that if they manage to survive five fights, they're virtually unbeatable from that point forward. And if the people in this room manage to do five cricothyrotomies in actual patients, you'd never have any fear to do this procedure again. Show of hands, how many people have done five real patients? All right, there's just a scattered handful. How many have done one on a real patient? All right, more, but not everyone. How many people would feel comfortable if a patient crashed in front of them to do one right now. Show of hands. All right, I need it to be everyone. I need it to be every single person in this room that manages airways. It has to happen, as my friend Cliff would say. Now, Rich Levitan talks about the concept of the surgically inevitable airway. The airway that they're not yet dead, but they're going to progress to cricothyrotomy. And if you do it now, the patient will never critically desaturate. They'll never have a cardiac arrest. If you wait until you're forced, it's too late. Now, I've done more than my share of cricothyrotomies, and the reason I've gotten those numbers is because when they are surgically inevitable, my team progresses to cutting the neck. We don't wait till we're forced. That's too late. That's when it becomes even more difficult. And in my shop, at least, no patient should ever die without a definitive airway. It's, it's unacceptable to me to ever call a code in a patient you couldn't get an airway from above without at least trying to perform a cricothyrotomy. So I'm going to try to give you uh, 10 ways not to mess this up. And uh, there's no substitution for actually doing this. But I think if you keep these theories, these ideas in mind, and you then move to your next surgical airway. Uh, I hope it helps a little bit. So number one, the biggest problem is not one of your hands. It's one of your head. We're scared to make the cut. We're not mentally prepared to do this procedure. And having seen that happen on a number of occasions, I created this idea called Crycon. And I did a whole podcast about it. You could listen to it if you like. But what my friend Nick Crimes taught me is that this may be too complicated. You can't keep it in mind. And um, he spurred me to a simplification. So this is version number two. And it's simple. Every single airway you do, you understand there's a potential to need a surgical airway. And so if you predict it to not be difficult, and you think it's going to be routine, then you still consider the surgical airway. You put your hands on the patient's neck, you feel the anatomy, you get an idea of whether this should be easier or harder, and you have the ability, the equipment, to do the cricothyrotomy within eye shot. It doesn't need to be open, it just needs to be there, it needs to be checked, and I'll tell you what that equipment is in just a bit. Now, on the other hand, if you look at this patient and say, this patient has the potential to be a difficult airway. Well, now you're in the yellow category. And for those patients, you actually put a mark at the point of the cricothyroid membrane. And you do that because, sure, maybe it'll carve off a couple seconds 
when you actually need to cut. But that's not why you put the mark there. The reason you mark that patient's neck, and I like to do it with a black Sharpie marker, is because it lets every single person in the room know that if you do progress to cutting the neck, you didn't fail, you didn't screw up, you had predicted this had the potential to happen, and you knew this was coming, and now you're doing what was planned ahead of time. It mentally prepares you. The cognitive action of taking that marker and putting it to neck will cut down on the barriers to you taking that scalpel to the neck. So you put a big black mark on the neck, and that tells everyone there, this was known, and you were not a screw up that you couldn't get it from above. And then in these patients, the kid is at the bedside ready to go. And then the red category of Crycon 2. This is the patient that you think is risky, they have the potential to critically desaturate, or they may be desaturating already, but you're going to take one attempt from above before you cut the neck. And in these patients, before you move to that attempt, you inject the neck with lidocaine with epinephrine if you have it readily available. It'll cut down on bleeding. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. You prep the neck, again, if you don't have it, don't worry about it. But you open up the kit, you have everything you need to perform the procedure, and it's in hand, which means someone else is going to be trying from above because you are standing at the ready to perform the cricotherotomy. All right. The next way we fail is we think there's backup. We're reliant on someone else. We think there's going to be someone to come save the day. That's not a mental strategy that works. We had one of the most elite trauma surgeons in the world sitting up here, and then he had to go catch his plane, and he's not here anymore. If we were reliant on Karim to cut the neck for you, he's gone. The surgeon you think is in-house may be repairing a retrohepatic IVC injury. They can't leave that OR. They might be doing other cases. You have to be the backup. If you pick up a laryngoscope, you have to be capable of taking the failed airway plan to its culmination. Sure, there's potential cases where you want to call in some friends, but the situation is the more sick the patient, the less reliant you could be on backup. You have to be self-contained. This is not going to be what saves your patients. All right, number three, we don't know the anatomy. This is what Rich has talked about throughout this entire conference. You need to know the anatomy of the airway. And study after study shows we're really bad at finding the cricothyroid membrane. These structures, they're not complicated, but you need to know them intimately. Now, there's two great videos that I recommend, and I have them at mcrit.org slash smack. Georgie Harris did one that was recorded for this conference, and Andy Neal out of Ireland does an incredible series on the anatomy of emergency medicine, and he'll show you everything you need to know about the anatomy for cricothyrotomy. So I recommend them highly. But the way we screw up anatomically is we verge off midline. If you are cutting midline, Pretty much anything that happens will be okay if you get something to the airway from a midline incision, even if you're in the wrong place. So if you stay in the midline, you'll be safe. There won't be any vascular catastrophe. And if eventually you could find the scalpel somewhere that accesses that patient's airway and stick a bougie and then a tube in, you'll be good. So stick midline, if nothing else. We err by going too high. In fact, at Janus General, just three days before I came here, they did a cricothyrotomy and went through the thiohyoid and weren't able to get into the airway. They were too high. If you're going to air towards anything, air towards too low. That's where the good stuff is. If you can't find what you want, stay right by the sternal notch, go a couple centimeters up, and try cutting there. That's going to be where the money is. We feel wrong. When I was taught to assess the neck for a surgical airway, I was taught to go from above and find the thyroid. And in a man with a prominent Adam's apple, or some of the uh, other people around who you're not quite sure what the gender is, um, there's going to be a prominent Adam's apple. But in, in some people, there won't. You won't feel anything up there. And that's how you wind up too high. So if you start low, and the first structure you feel popping out into your finger, that's the cricoid, and right above that's going to be the cricothyroid. And if you can't find anything else, just finding that sternal notch will tell you where midline is and where to cut. That's the way to do this. Don't start from above, work your way down. Start at the sternal notch, 
work your way up, find the cricoid, and then the cricothyroid. We're scared of blood. This is a bloody procedure. This is a procedure that is not visual, it's tactile. Once you make that first cut through skin, there will be bleeding. You cannot rely on your eyes at that point. You can't waste time suctioning that blood, attempting to get a view. You cannot be scared of the bleeding. As long as you don't manage to cut the carotid, any bleeding there is totally controllable. They will not exsanguinate during your cricothyrotomy. And it looks scary, and the first time you see it, you think you've made a mistake because there's blood welling up through your entire incision. You didn't make a mistake. It's supposed to bleed. Expect it. Don't let it stop you. Keep going. The way to solve that bleeding is to finish the procedure. Put the tube in, and then any bleeding you could cause is totally responsive to direct pressure, and it'll be able to be fixed, and the patient will not exsanguinate. Do not stop for the bleeding. The mistake people make is they try to fix the blood. They grab four by fours and shove it in there, and they ask their friends to try to hold pressure at the same time they're trying to cut. Don't do it. Use your finger. You'll feel where you need to make your cut, and then just do it and put the tube in. There is nothing vascular that is dangerous in the midline. I had to do a cricothyrotomy on a patient on clopidogrel. It's not fun, and it bled like stink. But in the grand scheme of things, they lost a minimal amount of blood, even though it looks petrifying. The patient could not exsanguinate through this incision. All right, the other way, the next way we mess up, we injure ourselves or our team, and this is not the way to do it, is to save the patient and then have our team members exposed to harm. Every single time I've performed this procedure, I've been splashed in the face by blood when I make that incision through the membrane. There's a burst of air every time. There's some pent up pressure that's going on in there. And every time you make that cut, there's a very satisfying spray of blood in your face. And that's when you know, ah, got it. But if you are not wearing a mask with a visor, then that's gonna be in your eyes. If your team is not wearing a mask with a visor, it's gonna be in theirs. So I don't care if the patient's dying, take the time to put something to protect your eyes. And then your hands are gonna be shaken. My hands are shaken, and you're gonna be wielding sharp objects. So when you put that scalpel down, make sure you know where you do it, and make sure it's safe for everyone involved. All right. Number six, we regress to a misperception of safety and familiarity. Resuscitationists, intensivists, ED docs, we're, we're comfortable with needles and wires. Uh, so much of what we do is predicated on that. We like the Seldinger technique. We, we take a sense of safety from it. But in this case, in a true crash surgical airway, in direct contradistinction to playing with mannequins in a lab, the needle, the wire, it fails us. It's not good in the real world when we're stressed. Now, Dr. Andrew Hurd has done amazing work in this area, and he recommends the needle first to anesthetists that don't have familiarity with cutting, with scalpels. And if you're really in that situation, if you can't put in a chest tube, okay, maybe you could try the needle approaches. I'm not gonna speak to, to that. I, I think most of the people in this room were resuscitationists, we know how to cut. And if you do have even a modicum of knowledge and skill on how to use a scalpel, then the scalpel fails better than the needle and the wire. This keeps coming up, but uh, Cliff and I, we looked at this book on combat, and what happens when you are in the red zone of heart rate and stress is your fine motor skills disappear. Your ability to thread a wire and then dilate it without that wire kinking, that's gone. But I could put a scalpel in your hand, and even if your hand's shaking, you'll be able to make these two cuts. They're pretty much gross skills at that point. You don't need to be perfect, you don't need to be pretty, you just need to stick it somewhere. It fails better. This is why we recommend the knife and not the needle. So this is the way to go in my mind. But then we could fail by using the wrong surgical technique. When I was being trained in surgical critical care, they taught me the standard surgical technique. And 
it works, but there's so many points of failure. There's so many ways it could go wrong. And in the old days, when patients in spinal immobilization didn't receive intubation for fear that you would move that spinal injury, they all received cricothyrotomies. And there was a huge failure rate, a dr dramatic, scary failure rate. And most of those failures were because at some point, you had to take your instrument out of the cricothyroid membrane and just blindly stick a tube in. And those tubes went in all sorts of weird places and the patient's neck would blow up like the Michelin man. This does not work. This is not acceptable anymore. Instead, I recommend bougie guided cricothyrotomies. This emerged from the battlefield where they have to be able to get it right while stressed, while in the midst of the worst conditions. Bougie guided crike is what I teach. It's the only technique I use right now. And I use a variant called the scalpel finger bougie. And I didn't create this. People much smarter than I did uh, work this out. But this is, I think, where to go. You take your scalpel, and you're going to make two cuts. You're going to cut from the thyroid prominence to the bottom of the cricoid. And that's if you can feel the anatomy. If you can't feel the anatomy, go all the way from the sternal notch to two-thirds up on the neck. Make a great big incision. Um, and then the worse the situation, the bigger the incision could be. It's just like a chest tube. Somehow my residents, my registrars, make a thoracotomy-sized incision when they're putting chest tubes in sick patients. That's OK. We could sew it up. Relieving that tension pneumothorax is more important. And now you're going to make a second cut. And it's actually two cuts, because you're going to plunge that scalpel through the cricothyroid membrane, and you're going to pull towards you, turn it around, and push away from you. Now, what if you plunge too far? You can't. And my friend Rich Levitan calls this the cartilaginous cage. That cricothyroid membrane is backed by cartilage. You cannot go too far when you plunge that scalpel in. It is safe. There is no way you can miscut if you're in the right place here. You can't cut laterally too far. You can't cut posteriorly too far. You can't cut superior or inferiorly too far. It's almost like it was custom built for this procedure. It's, it's truly amazing. You can't screw it up if you're in the right place. So you plunge, pull towards you, push away. And now you're going to put your finger in. And the finger serves a bunch of purposes. When you plunge your finger in, don't just do it a little bit so that you feel the, the cartilage on either side of your finger. Plunge all the way down. Plunge as far as your finger will go. And what your finger will touch is the posterior wall of the cricoid cartilage. And now you will know beyond the shadow of a doubt you're in the right place because you have cartilage all circumferentially around your finger and then the tip of your finger touches that posterior cricoid, you cannot be anywhere else in the airway. No matter how much blood is there, you know you are where you need to be. And now you've dilated that incision to the exact size you need for putting a small endotracheal tube or a trach through that hole. You are now set at that point. Your pulse rate should dramatically drop because everything's going to go OK. But then we add in the bougie. We ride the bougie along our finger. We feel the bougie go exactly where our finger is. And we feel it pass our finger to go down into the airway. And now the bougie will be the conduit that forces the endotracheal tube to go in the right place. It can't go anywhere else. So at that point, you grab a 6.5, 6 endotracheal tube, or a 6 trach, and you just ride it on the bougie. And you could corkscrew it, and you could push as hard as you want, because it's going to be forced to go where it needs to go. Can I have that first video? All right, so here's the actual procedure. And it really matters where you put your hands. And my friend Rich Levitan talks about this. I had to figure it out by experience. And he'll tell you if you ever go to his course right up front. But so your non-dominant hand goes and actually holds between your thumb and middle finger the thyroid cartilage, which I have right here. And this leaves your index finger free um, for palpation. And now the scalpel, which is closed now because I don't want to make my resident scared, um, would be in your dominant hand, um, held as if you know how to hold a scalpel, with your uh, hypothenar eminence resting on the chest of the patient. And this allows you to have very controlled, even though your hands are shaking from stress, movements um, without uh, you know, this sort of thing happening. So I'll now reposition my hands how they were. So 
Non-dominant hand, thumb and middle finger on the thyroid, touching membrane with, uh, with my index finger. I rest my uh, dominant hand on the chest. I'm going to cut from the thyroid through skin to the bottom of the cricoid, about a one inch incision. I'm now going to refeel the membrane through skin. I'm going to get my scalpel in there, and I'm going to go towards me all the way. I'm going to flip, go away from me all the way, all the way in until I, get, until I could touch the back of the cricoid. At this point, I grab my bougie, and I'm going to run the bougie along my finger and feel it enter the same space as my finger is. And only at that point does my finger come out. And now, and now the bougie will be advanced until I know it's past the sternal notch right here. So at least this much of bougie has gone in. And then I slowly and gently advance until I reach hold up. I've reached hold up now. At this point, I could grab the bougie, place a 6.5 ET tube on top, and then railroad with a twisting motion, the tube, just till the cuff passes, bougie's out. In Do it. Try it out in the lab, see if you like it. Can I have the second video, my friends? This is a simulation by Yen Chow, uh, a Dr. friend of mine out in Canada. I'm going to have to cut the neck up, so I can barely feel anything there. I'm just going to do a midline cut. Okay. All right, I can feel the membrane there. So that's his first cut. Here comes his second cut. Okay, I'm in. There's some blood coming out. Now he, he tried that handle thing. Now, I don't recommend that. Just plunge in with your okay. finger. He's putting the bougie in. Okay, my two so many. Okay. I think we measured that at 18 seconds. It doesn't need to be that quick. It just needs to get done. I had uh, a patient I wanted to um, show of actual anatomy, doing it for real, but we couldn't get permission from the hospital, and it's a shame. There's not great videos out there of this being done. If you could ever get one, please send it to me so I could put it in these presentations, because that's what I really want to show you, is a real cricothyrotomy in a crash situation. All right. The other way we fail is misplaced tube. The bougie is the solution to that. Or Rich will show you his cric key. That's the solution to that. You can't blindly be placing these tubes in. If you feel that bougie go past the sternal notch and get hold up, that's a secondary confirmation. It tells you you're in the right place. It can't be anywhere else. You can't manage to somehow have gotten in the esophagus if you went past the sternal notch with your bougie and got hold up. The bougie stops. All right. Sometimes you can't feel any surface anatomy. And if that stops you, that's a huge problem. It shouldn't. In that case, you're going to spread at all the soft tissue, and then cut to air. What does that mean? It means you make a huge skin incision. It could be all the way up the neck, I don't care. And then you get two fingers in on either side, or you have a partner doing, you just keep spreading the crap, the tissue, out of your way, and you keep sticking your finger in until you feel cartilage, trachea, anatomy, and then you'll continue the procedure. So may I have that uh, final video, please? A midline incision up to eight to 10 centimeters. This is Andrew Hurd's video. Should be made to the depth of the strap muscles. The anesthetist should then insert the fingers of both hands and bluntly dissect and separate these muscles, keeping in mind that the trachea may not be found in the midline. Airway structures should then be identified and stabilized. Just spread, 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 spread. Just keep spreading, keep spreading, and stick your finger in. Eventually, you will find cricoid, thyroid, trachea. You'll find things that feel cartilaginous. There's nothing else in the neck that's cartilaginous. There's nothing else in the neck that has rings. Just keep sp You cannot destroy things with your fingers. They are the safest tool in operative procedure. Just keep on spreading. You will find it, I promise. You will not rip asunder the carotid and the IJ, you will be okay. Keep spreading until you feel something with your finger. All right, the ninth way we fail is we fail to train. You have to train on this, but you could do a hundred of these in training with very little equipment. This is what we used in our SMAC airway workshop. And if you just go to mcrit.org.smack, I have the instructions for making these, but it's just some vent tubing and two pieces of tape with some uh, tape covering, um, two rolls of tape with some tape covering them. This is not perfect. 
we're going to get better. Rich Levitan's building anatomically correct versions of this, but it gives you the skills, it gives you the mindset, and then if you take this and put it into the mental simulator that you know, Cliff talks about, this will get you very close to where you need to be. The last way we screw this up is we fail to consider the awake cricothyrotomy. In a patient who's maintaining their airway, but is surgically inevitable, putting them to sleep can be death. And instead, we should put them in their position of comfort we should dissociate them, and we should perform the cricothyrotomy while they're still awake and breathing. If you have a shotgun to the face and the patient has to sit up 30 degrees to maintain a saturation of 100%, but they keep spitting up blood, RSI in this patient may be incredibly dangerous. Paralyzing this patient may be incredibly dangerous, but allowing them to continue to breathe while you perform an awake cricothyrotomy could be life-saving and actually a lot less stress than anything else you could do because you have all the time in the world. So the awake crike, I dissociate with ketamine. They'll continue to breathe, but they will not feel pain. It's a marked analgesic, small aliquots, 10 milligrams or so at a time. And then if you have the time, put some local in there. Well, lidocaine with epinephrine in just a, a minute or two, you're going to be able to make that first incision with no pain. Feel the cricothyroid. I actually, if you have a second, will inject through the cricothyroid. They'll cough up more of that lidocaine. And then make your cut and put your bougie in. Even if they start moving around, once that bougie is in, you're going to be able to complete this procedure, even if they start coughing. And now, if you can't get it, if you can't find it, you haven't lost anything. They're still breathing. And now you have to move to another plan. All right, so all the stuff that goes along with this is at mcrit.org slash smack. Let's review what we talked about. How do we screw up the cricothyrotomy? We're not mentally prepared. We haven't put on that armor that Rich talks about. We think there's going to be backup. There won't be. When you need it most, you're going to be the only person you can rely on. We don't understand and learn the anatomy. We're scared of blood. Don't be. You cannot cause the patient to exsanguinate through this incision. We don't protect and keep safe our team. We fall back on comfort. We go for those needles and wires because we think they're going to help us. They're going to fail in real life. We choose the wrong way to cut. We don't choose the safest way out there. We don't cut to air when we can't feel surface anatomy. You have to cut, spread, spread, spread. You'll feel it and then make your next cut and you'll have that reassuring burst of air into your face covered you, covering you in blood. We don't train enough and we're failing on this. We need better trainers, but even now with what's out there, you could do a good job mentally preparing yourself for this. And then we don't understand that sometimes sleep equals death. We don't consider the awake cricothyrotomy. So surgical airway, don't screw it up. If you manage airways, you must be adept at cricothyrotomy. You must be able to continue the failed airway paradigm to its very end. You can cut to cure. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Natalie, have people been feeding the Twitter beast? Absolutely, of course they have. Thank you, Scott. Um, there's a, a, a question that's come from two people, actually, that's quite technical. Rahul and uh, Tess wanted to know, is there a risk that you can lose that tract between taking out your scalpel and putting in the finger, and have you got any tips for ensuring that that doesn't happen? Sure. I mean, some people talk about the, the question, everyone, yeah, you, you're on mic. Um, it, if you make that incision big enough and your index finger is right there, you can't fail. And some people talk about putting you know, the finger along the scalp or putting objects like hooks along the scalp. One, uh, yeah, it, that works in the lab. It, when you need that hook, it's not going to be there. And you won't lose this track. If you make the incision, as I have mentioned, you know, pulling the full length of the cartilage, it's not going anywhere at that point. It's not disappearing. So I take the scalpel out and my finger goes in immediately. And I haven't had a problem with that yet. Great stuff. And there was one more question about the, the risk of bleeding into the airway. How big a problem is that? And is there anything you can do about it? Again, the bleeding looks scary, but when you actually, if you ever measured out how much they're actually bleeding, it's not even a remotely worrisome amount. And um, whatever blood gets in that airway, it's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be a problem. Blood is actually, you know, fairly uh, innocuous in the pulmonary tract. Uh, opposed to most of the other things you're going to aspirate. So it's going to be fine. Don't even think about it. Great. Thank right. you. Thank Thanks you. again, folks.